How about it for the Center for Louisiana Studies, Festival of Cadillac, Creole, everybody coming out, all the volunteers, all the sponsors. Thank you all for being here. How about it for CJ Chenier, everybody? Sonny Landreth. Sherelle Mouton. We've got a lot to talk about because when you want to talk about the life and legacy of Clifton Chenier, uh, you're talking about the history of, of all of us. You're talking about a long time, you're talking about a lot of accomplishments, you're talking about a lot of spreading the word about what's special about the way we live and the way we do things. And when you talk about his legacy, you just all you need to look no farther than, than the three individuals here and, and so many more around the festival grounds and, and beyond around the world. Um, there are so many things to say about Clifton, and just to set us up a little bit, I, I thought I would throw a little bit of a timeline on things, because when you talk about the life and legacy of Clifton Chenier, you're talking about the entire history of us as Creoles, as Cajuns, and to put a finer point on that, Clifton would be 98 right now. Sherelle's grandfather, Cleveland, would be 103 right now. And so when you look at the century of the Chenier's, you go back to Cleveland's birth in 1920, Clifton's in 1925. That's before they were recording our music. And then when you kind of look at the timeline, 1928, Cleombro Falcon records Alonso Lafayette. 1929, Amade Arduin and Dennis McGee start recording. Clifton's a little boy. It's the Great Depression. He's up in St. Landry Parish with his brother. He's working in the fields. He's playing the accordion. He's listening to the radio. He's hearing things like Joe Liggins and the Honey Dripper and Louis Jordan. And then he's going to these parties and these picnics and these la-las and these, these, these get-togethers and there's this accordion music. There's this percussion music. There are these lyrics, there are these rhythms. And then what a lot of folks don't really, I don't think spend a lot of time thinking about is through the 1930s and the 1940s, he just kept doing his thing. And it wasn't until he was about 29 in 1954, he went over to Texas and he made a recording at a radio station. And then he went out to Los Angeles and made recordings in Los Angeles. And then he went to Chicago and made recordings in Chicago. And then he came down here and made recordings in Crowley. And then in the 60s, he hooked up with this guy named Chris Strockwitz, and we have some of the Arhuli archival photos up here. And I think that's when it really kind of all came together. A lot of this roots music, this electric music, this R&B, all started kind of becoming one thing. And there's a lot more history that we'll get to that comes after all of that. Because this music, this food, this dance, this way of life was not known until Clifton started going to Europe, and Clifton started traveling the country, well, continuing to travel the country, and playing the Creole Trail, playing all the dance halls, the, 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 the church halls, all the way out to the West Coast and back, in the company of these artists and family members. And so I bet we all wish we had a time machine, and we could go back. And today, you're gonna get five minutes in a time machine because thanks to some friends of ours in New Orleans, we recently discovered a 1980, June 7th, 1980 recording of Clifton Chenier and his Red Hot Louisiana band at Tipitina as it's coming out in December. And talking about this huge timeline of our history, there was a period in the 70s where all of a sudden Little Buck and Jumpin' Joe and John Hart and Buckwheat were in that band. And they were doing some amazing things. And then Clifton started getting ill and he had some health challenges. And he came back in 1980 with a, with a new band. His son CJ is on saxophone. 29 year old man named Sonny Landreth, first white member of the band's on guitar. And all of a sudden, Party Down had a new sound. So let's take a little, a little one minute listen to Tipitina's. Close your eyes for a minute and picture yourself right there in the one story version of Tipitina's. Cover charge is probably about five bucks. Probably about 300 people there.
<laughs> CJ Chenier on saxophone right there. Uh, I have to say something. That first note he played on the solo, this was the short version. <laughs> he does a, he can do a thing called circular breathing. Dickie knows all, all about this. Where you uh, you learn to take a breath a certain way and you hold it while you're playing the note. It's incredible. So he would do that for like two or three minutes. You know, people tension would build, build. He finally hit the next note. People go crazy. So I just thought he did the edited version of Tim Tinker. So. Take us back there, CJ. Tell us what was going on on June 7th, Saturday night, New Orleans. Well, you know, uh, there was always a party, man. You know, when uh, Clifton Chanel was in town, everybody got down. That's the way it was, because uh, he was like a party animal. When you got on stage, man, no matter whether he was standing up or sitting down, you know, it was just this energy that came from him. And when you're up there with him, there's nothing you can do but try to hold on and follow him. <laughs> try to hold on, man. See if you can grab it and hold on to it, because he was gone with it. Well, and I hinted at it, but y'all y'all came into the band at a, at, at a really unique time. I mean, John Hart, you know, on tenor, he's playing reeds. Your dad's playing reeds. They've got this interlock thing. And then Little Buck comes in in the mid-70s. He's playing. That's... That's Sherelle's dad, Little Buck Senegal, by the way. And so you guys are seeing this amazing band, and then all of a sudden, y'all need to step into their shoes. Well, I actually thought John Hart was going to be there. When, he, when my dad called and said, okay, come meet me, and I was like, all right, I get to play with John Hart. And I got that he wasn't there, man. I was like, uh-oh, because I didn't know. I didn't know anything, and I was just... I was so green, you know, I was like two years out of school and didn't have a clue what I was supposed to do up there, but, you know, all the band had patience with me and they all tolerated me learning, <laughs> you know, it was a good thing. Well, and Sonny and I were talking, you heard a little bit of it there and a little bit of a breakdown, and we'll hear some other bits later. Just Clifton and Cleveland and Robert St. Julian, GD on the drums just by themselves. They were like a rhythm orchestra. You know, he had the bass side of the accordion, he had the, oh, yeah. the piano side. Yeah, he, it, it was incredible, and I've never heard anything like that uh, before or since. And the other thing that would happen uh, when he'd get into the old school Zydeco, uh, he'd break it down just to them. And then we'd just kind of stand there, or, I did, or somebody did something he got mad about, and he threw us all off stage. He'd say, just me, Cleveland, and Robert. Y'all get off the stage. And so we had to leave, and they get in the groove, and, and Gramps would get in that, we call it the Zydeco trance, man, when he started leaning forward on the, on the flatois, man, it was, that's when it really gets serious. And, uh, can, can I say one thing? Everybody call it old school. I call it real school. <laughs> and uh, Sherelle, your mom is here. Cleveland's daughter is in the house. <laughs> Cleveland's great granddaughter is in the house. <laughs> Tell us about your experience with music, Sherelle. How did, how did you come into all this? I had no choice. I think it, it was given, you know, with dad being Lil Buck and grandfather being Cleveland, it is in my DNA. And I'm so very thankful. Um, I was never taught um, how to play. I can read music, but I was never taught. It was just always in the ear. And, and most important, it was always in my heart. I'm growing up listening to KRVS every, every Saturday, still on the way here, listening to KRVS. And I'm um, just listening to it and picking it up and wait for those guys to come off tour. I was pretty little, but I knew every time they came back, I had Reese's Pieces waiting on my dresser from my grandfather. So I knew he was he was home. And uh, once he was home, he, he didn't pick up the front and he put it down. It was time to go. That was it. But when he was home, he was home. And um, 
very a gentle giant, you know, big, big guy, but very little words. I'm sure CJ has way more sores than me. So now I'm just reading about it. But the time that I did have was a, a time that, again, if I could go back and do it again, I'd do it all over again. But such an honor to be part of this lineage on both sides of this great music called Zydeco. And um, it, I, I'm pleased to be able to be able to play this washboard. This is the original washboard uh, that Cooper played on. And talking about how Clifton, I mean, he, he did it all. You know, you can talk about, oh, he was a great musician or, or a great singer or a good arranger, a good band leader. Uh, he was a trailblazing career. He was, he was somewhat fearless to have traveled these highways and byways back, back in the day. But he was also an amazing songwriter. And if you were here last night, you heard song after song and all weekend and in all the clubs. But I mean, you could just go down a list of pick any song, A.T. Fee, I'm on the Wonder. Just go down the list of Clifton Chenier songs. He, he wrote an incredible amount of material. And as you mentioned, Sherelle, you've got some artifacts because talking about that, um, that initial trio, thinking about Clifton and Cleveland playing together, you know, I'm sure house dances and stuff like that, they weren't traveling that much in the, in the 30s, especially in the 40s. Um, but they can make a lot of noise because of those scrapers he has. These are the original scrapers as well. Um, if anyone watches the videos of Jail Tail Ball or any of those, he'll let you know he's asked in that, that movie, well, how many do you play with here? And uh, he said 12 in all, six on each hand. So and these are, the ones, <laughs> these are the ones right here. I had eight. When it was given to me, there was eight left out of the 12. But these here has electricity in them. So if you want to see some electric, come check out CJ and us on stage and you can see something. Cool. Though I don't, I don't know how to play with them. That's something that I've, I never tried. So I play with the you know, spoons, but I carry them with me to have the soul and to have his wisdom and, and his talent carry me through any gig that I do play. You got but your mojo working. That's the mojo. <laughs> so if you guys ever want to come and take a look after this is over, feel free to come and take pictures and check these out. These are special. Very special. Thanks for bringing those. And she mentioned her frottoir. So Clifton and Cleveland were in Port Arthur with Willie Landry. And they, they drew in the sand. You know, hey, could we take this rope board and could we kind of put some Kind of hooks on it and kind of make it into more of a vest and that's considered one of the only instruments created in america it's in the smithsonian now their creation the modern rope board so he invented an instrument with his brother and with, with a great uh metal worker and we've got it here today and um and another thing is you talk about all this french roots and all this stuff but clifton was a blues man too and uh, you know, nowadays a lot of people try to distinguish about whether they play the blues or they don't play the blues. Um, I, I've got another clip. I want to play. Take you guys back to Tipitina's back in uh, 1980. And uh, what's interesting about this recording? It's coming out in uh, December, and and we had booked this panel and planned to talk about these things. And we've got some some topics we had in mind, but then all of a sudden there's this this artifact, and um, this is a version of Three O'clock Blues, but Clifton's quoting Sweet Little Angel. He's quoting all kinds of different lyrics. And uh, we're just here a little, a little two minutes back on stage with these folks at Tipitina's. Oh, sorry. Get my text straight. I'm down. I'm turned down. Here comes Jeff. Pull up. I'm a 
Andrews, E.J. Chenier, Cliff Chenier. I almost wish you hadn't done that. I can't play like that anymore. <laughs> but now we have documentation. So y'all are, about, about 10 people have heard this recording before right now. Um, this is a really serendipitous thing that it would just sort of come to light right now. And um, it's eight tracks, it's 40 minutes, it's from 43 years ago. And again, I just, can y'all take us back? What, 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 there was about a solid year where you guys were the band, y'all were going all over, y'all were playing every club in South Louisiana and beyond. And we were staying in motels with one bed for two minutes. <laughs> I wasn't going to give that up. But I... There's some road dogs still there. <laughs> and a whole lot of snoring going on. I mean, oh, man. it was uh, Jazz Fest. We had four in the room. And uh, I just remember waking up. <laughs> well, anyway. And the next morning, uh, Cliff came in, and uh, it was like we were just getting ready to go play Jazz Fest. And uh, he was all dressed up, and he walked in, and he said, what are you boys doing? You know, and he went in there and uh, got ready for the gig, and that's all. It was uh, the London Lodge. <laughs> the London Lodge uh, <laughs> yeah, the London on the Airline Highway. Yeah. No double beers, just a single. So. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, just so y'all know, the grandmaster snorer of them all was my Cleveland. Uncle Cleveland. Right. <laughs> He'll tell you, I'm going to give you a chance to go to sleep. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you better take that opportunity because once he crunk it up, that was it. <laughs> And then he wake up and just start talking to you. And then he starts snoring again right after he finishes his sentence. <laughs> and, and you know, I think another fascinating thing is that in 1980, um, you guys were also playing in, in the Sonny Landreth band with Robert St. Julian and with Cleveland. And uh, Tell us about that. Yeah, well, that came a, a little bit later because uh, CJ was actually already in the band when, when I came on board. Um, so we started hanging out together, the two young guys, you know. And I'd go over to uh, CJ's house in his mom's house in uh, Fort Arthur, and, and we'd sort of meet there. And then, Cliff and the band would come and pick us up and away we go, you know, so that was just like part of the routine. Um, and we did that for about a year. But at one point, um, I made the album, uh, an album in Crowley um, called Blues Attack. So I got all of them together as a favor, you know, to come in and, and part of what would become uh, Bayou Rhythm. So that's how they got started. And we cut like 10 songs in three hours. It was fun too. Yeah. And, and then we just, one after another, you know, it was, it was, I've never had an experience like that. Um, so that's how it kind of segued. And at one point, then uh, the band I had went out and started playing in Colorado and come back here and do the festivals and that kind of thing. And, uh, and uh, we played with Zachary. I see his picture back here. And at one point, then um, CJ came on board with us, and that's when it really started eating up. And uh, we started going up into the mountains. Those people never heard anything like that, because that's when you really started to play accordion more. Yeah, yeah. I, don't know. I was a little, I was getting in the groove at that time, you know. But I was still playing saxophone and keyboard, and trying to play the accordion. <laughs> Uh, he did well, but he, he, but so he did all of that in our band. He, he played uh, all those instruments, and uh, it was really amazing. And, and one day we went up to um, your dad's hotel room, and he was showing you, you know, some of the mojo on the accordion, and that was incredible to watch. Um, but it's great to have that and be part of that, and you get off the ground there. The rest is history. Yeah. 
Well, and speaking of history, again, this is an amazing slice, a little moment in time um, when you guys met and started playing together and, and, and doing all these things. And, you know, Clifton had been laying the groundwork. He, as I mentioned, he, he drove out west in about 1955 to make records in Los Angeles. And, you know, there, there was no GPS, there, there were no cell phones, uh, there were no pagers, there were no fax machines, um, just a bunch of dudes in a car who believed in themselves that they could go sing in French and play accordion and people might like that record. And, and they did. And then as time went on, you know, in the seventies, Dickie Landry sitting right there, he brought Clifton to Carnegie Hall and Clifton went to the Montreux Jazz Fest. And then not long after Sonny was in the band, CJ, you, you stayed along for the whole ride, Grammy win. All of a sudden, Cajun and Zydeco becomes the most popular thing on earth, and there's Cajun Spice Ruffles, and Burger King has the Cajun Whaler. <laughs> and it's like, how did all that happen? And now, Clifton's uh, won a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Grammys. Bogalusa Boogie is in the Grammys Hall of Fame of Recordings. And, um, you know, the world out there is, is a better place. And I think something that a lot of folks wonder because he's, again, he's this famous figure. He was very large. He wore the crown. He, like his son, he had really big hands. He could do anything with that accordion. What was he like as a person? What was it like if Cliff could, could be here right now? What would we learn about his personality? Not to mess with him too much. <laughs> he always had Hawaii. He didn't see Hawaii Bible. We always had Hawaiian Bible by his side. You know, like. <laughs> I've heard it called Little Hawaii too. Don't make me get Little Hawaii. <laughs> nah, he was a very, very even, even killed person. He was like real calm all the time, except when he got on stage. That's when the electricity happened. But he was not. He wasn't. Uh, he was just, you know, himself, man. He, was, he didn't have attitudes. He didn't have none of that kind of stuff. He just believed in his music. He walked around humming the blues, and sometimes he pulled out a harmonica out of his pocket and whip a few notes on it. You know? That's just how he was all the time. And you see him all the time in a three-piece suit. That was it, you know. Seven o'clock in the morning, Clifton Chenier had a three-piece suit on with a tie. And that's no joke. And when he played, take the coat off, turn the tie to the back, whip it out, four hours, turn the tie back to the front, put his coat back on, and that was a wrap. Yeah, and he was really gracious too, like bringing me in. And because uh, a lot of people saw me, what's he doing in the band? It was kind of an odd, <laughs> kind of standing out, you know. And, uh, and, but he, I mean, he held to it, and uh, I think part of what he would do, he would say, uh, we played some of the, you know, the clubs out in the country, and and he would say, how y'all like my guitar player from California? <laughs> Somehow that made it okay. You know? <laughs> that was the only applause I ever got. Uh, but we would go to people's houses during the day, you know, and way before the gig, and. Uh, They'd be cooking up a huge meal, and then we'd dance the records. And that whole thing started all you know, all day, and eventually uh, segued into the, the gig. And it was really wonderful because I, I felt welcomed into the uh, Creole community too. And, uh, the first time I heard Cliff, for me, I'm getting into the blues and all that as a kid, and then I heard about this, uh, this guy who played blues on accordion. And, uh, you know, I was used to watching, you know, Lawrence Well with my parents. And so that concept just somehow, I had to go check that out, you know? <laughs> I'm 16, 17 years old, and so a buddy of mine and I went to the Blue Angel Club. We heard that he played there. And he saw us, he was inside, he saw us at the door, we're kind of peeking in, and not knowing what to do, and he said, hey, so, come on in here, come on in here. And he sat us down with him, and from that point on, um, you know, it was like, you know, welcome, you know, welcoming me in, and uh, 
So when years later I got to play with him, finally, it was like a dream come true. So that's how that all started. So he was that kind of person, and he and he stuck to it. Yeah. And what about Uncle Cleveland? I mean, he did he ever pick up the accordion or the harmonica, or did he just stick with the rub board? He was the master. <laughs> I wasn't born, couldn't tell you. <laughs> A predated question. <laughs> well, in, in my, I didn't get there until 1978, and I always only saw Cleveland playing the rug board. You know, that was that was his thing, with that big giant smile and that finesse that he had on the. He was everybody that loved Cleveland, everybody. Yeah. And I also heard he was also one not to really mess with because he was so quiet and calm. And I've heard a couple of stories where. You know, somebody ticked them off a few times and they really saw a different side in him that they weren't used to seeing. Oh, so, okay, well, we ain't gonna mess with that no more either. <laughs> well, uh, these days, CJ and Sonny, you know, you guys headline these, these big festivals and there's backstage and there's, you know, limos and shuttles and, but back in, back in 1980, there wasn't, it wasn't, it was probably a lot more like this. <laughs> In terms of the amenities, uh, you know, the the, the luxuries uh, were not there. And for Clifton, that was decades and decades. In Cleveland, that was decades and decades. I think uh, Lafayette Associates here, and when I was working on my book about Clifton, one time he told me, he said, man, the first time I heard Clifton Chenier, it sounded like surf music from Jupiter. Just <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty, I used to put it in the book. And, uh, and the other night I was, speaking with someone, I said, oh yeah, we're doing this thing Saturday. And he said, yeah, he said, man, the first time I saw Clifton Chenier, Sonny was playing guitar with him. And I was like, what's that guy doing on guitar? <laughs> so it was, a, it, was a, it was a cultural experience. And, um, and speaking of the cultural experience, I mentioned how y'all toured and y'all played around. Um, uh, this gentleman, Paul Bodie, I, I saw a picture he posted a few years ago. And, um, Clifton's got the crown on, you guys are on stage, and y'all are out at Verbum Day out in Los Angeles, which I know is the site where Dickie Landry brought Mick Jagger to meet Clifton Chenier. And uh, Clifton allegedly said, oh yeah, Rolling Stone, yeah, I think they did an article about me. <laughs> and, and they did. But, uh, they're both true. But, um, but talking about all this touring, um, as we were looking through these these recordings, and these recordings from Tipitina's, I mean, we're talking a cassette tape stuck into the soundboard, just the board mono mix. Again, 40 minutes that, that really kind of made the cut onto the record. Um, and it was, I guess there were several sets that the band played that night. But I guess when you guys were in Creole clubs. One set. Yeah. Four hours. Non-stop. Yeah. Bring your bucket. That's what my dad used to say. Bring your bucket. <laughs> and listening to these recordings, you know, he's he's mixing and matching lyrics and, and all kinds of stuff and, and riffs. And it was like, who has four hours of music in their head that they can just keep going? Yeah, and not only that, but he we would play the songs in the same key every night. Nope. You know? <laughs> Not the same I mean, lyrics. <laughs> anything. It was all improvised, you know. So that was a great learning experience for me, and, and uh, to get that opportunity and to find your way through it, and it was just amazing that he could do that. And just and every every night there was another song he played that I hadn't played with him. And um, so when these recordings came out, um, Dino Gankendorf and I were scouring the internet to try to figure out what song that was that's not on any other Clifton recording or, or, or record and um, the, uh, there's a little piece I'll do I've got one more little uh, snippet here and uh, it's uh, has anyone ever heard the song Feeling Happy by Big Joe Turner apparently Clifton knew it and not only did he not only did he knew it know it he drops in a verse out of Rabbit Foot Blues from 1927 by Blind Lemon Jefferson. And at the end, he says, let the good times roll, 
at the French La La. It's like everything could go into a song. Well, you see what 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 it was, man. Is my daddy didn't learn words. He kind of heard them, and then he made whatever he heard into his own. You know, so if, if he wanted to mix two or three songs together, that's just how it happened that night. <laughs> it's just that's the way it went down. You know, it, it was all natural. Now some songs he sang almost the same every night. Like I'm coming home. That was the one he sang, but. As far as for those other songs, man, no telling where they would go, you know? All we could do is follow. That was it, let's go. Let's, uh, let's take a quick little listen to this. Uh, and this, it, it's at the end of the record. I, it might've just been the end of a set, it, you know, I don't know, but I think he says good night at the end, but here's a little excerpt from uh, I'm Feeling Happy. there was only one recording of Sonny and the band and we're not sure where it is but now there's this new one and we are sure where it is so this is the only record of y'all playing together it's proof thankfully I was making it all up all these years <laughs> yeah there was uh, we did a <laughs> we did a uh, a radio station uh, I don't remember where it was I think it was in California somewhere in California probably yeah, yeah and uh, that was another time Cliff got mad because uh, he knew they were recording it to air it on another, you know, another night. So he sees the recording machine. Oh, oh no, that's not, that's not good. And uh, I know y'all gonna rip me off. And, you know, because oh, yeah. you know, back then they they had all got taken advantage of. But uh, some, somewhere there's that. But uh, you know, uh, that was uh, I guess I don't remember the name of the station, but. I'm glad this came out now. It's official, you know, actually mixed albums somewhat. So. And uh, I think we're listening back to it. You mentioned that uh, GD, Robert St. Julian, he's got this, this sort of stick technique, right? This. Yeah, he had a way of playing that all on the four on the snare with one hand. And usually uh, drummers use both hands to get the yeah. yeah. that. But he did it with one hand. And while he's doing that, He's riding a tang and the hump on the cymbal. And uh, uh, just uh, amazing what he could do. I've never played with anyone uh, that could do all that he did. And had a way of building up the songs. And uh, he and Cleveland, they just, it was just seamless, you know, when they came together. And each part of the song would have, uh, would get bigger and bigger. 
And you always knew what was going to happen with Big Robert because of the way he would lead into those sections. And you called that a double shuffle, huh? You said he was playing on that one, which again, there are, there are so many forms of music when you go back that Clifton, uh, like talking about like Joe Liggins and the Honey Dripper and Louis Jordan and all these things that sort of kind of came into the funnel and came out in different ways. And today, you may or may not hear some of these things played. You, you, you're not gonna see the, except for Little Pop, you're not gonna see the piano accordion. Except for him and CJ, you're not gonna see it that much. And, um, and so I guess kind of as we kind of go towards the end of the session, what do y'all think the world needs to know about the next hundred years of Chenier music and the legacy? Where's it all going? What do we need to make sure we hang on to? What do we need to take with us as we go down this road? Because Clifton he gave us a lot of lessons, right? How to, how to do things, how to do things well, how to take your culture to places where people don't know it, may not understand it, and then you all leave friends and fans. I mean, the this was this was the unknown back in the day, and um, and I don't think anyone blazed a trail like he did at Cleveland. Well, you know, uh, like I said, I didn't get involved until 1978. But even then, you know, traveling the world with my daddy, you know, I went, left Port Arthur and went to Austin where I turned 21 in his band. And then we went on up to California and Oregon and up into Washington State and into Canada. And I was so infatuated, man. It was like something. And I, I, I recognized at that point how much people really loved him because I, I didn't know, you know, I was. I was playing funk on saxophone and keyboards, and then all of a sudden I was in a Zydeco band, and I didn't realize. But for years and years and years, people would come up to me and say, what's Zydeco? I said, well, that's not how you say it. Yeah, I mean, but that, that, that goes to show you how, you know, they were so interested in the music, but they didn't really know much about it. So we were traveling all these places and all you could see, even when I was a kid and I would go hear my daddy play out people behind the stage, right? And even though I didn't know what he was saying or none of that stuff, I'd be back there. <laughs> because it's, it's, it, it, it'll take you like that. So all these people that loved them so much and, and three, four of them didn't even know how to say the word Zydeco. But they loved the music, they loved Clifton Chenier, they loved Cleveland Chenier, that sound that was coming off that stage, man. And everywhere he went, I don't care where it was, from Europe, I mean, uh, all over the United States, I was infatuated on how much people loved Mr. Clifton Shadir. Yeah. And Sonny, I know with your music, uh, we were listening to that blues, three o'clock blues earlier, and the way that y'all would do a minor blues in Clifton's band, I, I think that's kind of come into your music with your own band and your arrangements. Even though you're playing guitar, you're, you're, you're pulling some of his riffs and licks. Yeah, a lot of what I do uh, on slide guitar was um, actually inspired by what Clifton did on accordion and rhythmically, what Gramps Cleveland did. Uh, and, and Big Robin on the drums, believe it or not. All that had a big, uh, had a profound effect on me. Um, and the other thing too, um, talking about uh, how people all over the world, uh, we just couldn't help but be taken by the music is because it was so infectious. I mean, if it didn't make you move while you're sitting, you know, like they say, there's something wrong with you. you know? <laughs> but, um, and it's in that way it's a universal language because even uh, today and all these years of traveling and a lot of obscure places in Europe they know Clifton Chenier and uh, they have the recordings there uh, and it's really amazing to see that I think that's part of the legacy you know in a big way that uh, this music stands the test of time it's it will always be you know received that way and given the chance to hear it. Sherelle, you want to throw anything in on that? I just, you know, keep keep the culture alive, you know, just like we're doing now. And, you know, for people like Ansley and them putting on these festivals to keep all this going so it doesn't die off. 
Um, for me right now, I, I could just take it in. I'm still able to play with some of the originals from the band and that that's for me. You know, that's something I get to keep and share with the world. And um, I'm teaching the kids. I have one son that plays a guitar that my dad left behind and he's scared to take it to school every day because he's just like, what, what if I lose it? Man? But you're good. You, that, that guitar will protect you. The little one here, he's already trying to play washboard, so, <laughs> you know, and it's things like that, that we have to instill and buy those old records. I still have the vinyl that I play on, on record players, and I have Hot Pepper and, and King of Zodico on VHS. I sit them down and, and let them watch this and let them ask questions so they could go out and write books and, and throw festivals and to keep it going, because if we don't, it's going to die. And it's, a, it's a culture and a genre of music that you have to teach it, you know, but you can only learn from the ones who invented it at the end of the day. So I'm just very thankful and um, just keep spreading the word, you know, take it around the world and, and show the people what Southwest Louisiana could do with uh, soul, blues, and zydeco. So thank you so much. Awesome. I'll throw in a little plug. And, uh, in 1995, I, I started writing a book about Clifton Chenier. And in 2015, we published it. I, I do have a few copies of the first edition here. If anybody wants a signed copy, might even be able to get some uh, star autographs here. And I also wanted to mention that um, another guy from Lafayette, John Troutman, he's up at the Smithsonian these days. Um, he put out um, this book by Mac McCormick recently about Robert Johnson, the great Delta Blues man. And um, Mac McCormick was a folklorist who was the first guy to write the word Zydeco down in about the 1960s. And he wrote this book on Robert Johnson and he, he called it Biography of a Phantom. And it's a very interesting book about trying to put the pieces together of this man's life and music. And of course, when you talk about Robert Johnson or, or Muddy Waters or B.B. King or any of these great figures, you, you think of their contemporary Clifton Chenier. And uh, I want to thank our panel because Clifton is not a phantom. He was a very real, Cleveland was a very real person. And thanks to the music y'all are going to play on stage in just a little bit together, uh, it goes on and on, as Uncle Donald would say, right on. So uh, thank you very much, CJ Chenier, Sonny Lander, Sherelle Mousson. Oh, I can go. We can go. I thought it was a 45. Good. Well, I think we could do a couple quick audience questions. I know we have a hundred audience questions. I would just say, no testimonials, keep it short, don't ask anyone's age. And uh, yeah, we'll take a couple, uh, right there. You can just say it kind of loud. What about the gold tooth? Well, he was royalty, of course he had a gold tooth. What happened to it? We don't know. Let's, uh, let's uh, thank you for your deep musicological question. Yes. Muddy Waters credited your dad as the most exciting performer. All right. Yeah, <laughs> All right, we're good. And look, since we do, do you just have a minute, uh, a couple minutes, CJ, what time are you guys playing? 3.30. What, what y'all gonna do? Play a whole bunch of good music. And tell but, me- But, one thing my dad told me, he told me to be the best I could be at my own style. So, I'm not a Clifton Shalia clone. No, I hope I don't disappoint anybody. I never said, beside the records and try to learn his music note for note. I played saxophone on the side of him. I know every song he played. I know every song he know on saxophone. <laughs> Accordion, I did CJ Shadir for the last 40 years. So that's what I've been doing. Thank you. And where are you guys headed next? What, where can people see you guys play down the road? Uh, I'll be in Austin soon, Austin, Texas. And then, uh, 
we working on a project, and as a matter of fact, uh, myself and Sonny and Marsha Ball, and I'm even seeing if I can get Sherelle on some of those shows. Uh, oh, look out. Uh -huh. Going on the road now. <laughs> <laughs> so we're working on a project, and it's going to be good. So y'all look out for it. It's going to be a Bayou Boogie. Yeah. And you know, it's, um, I, uh, I hate to make a, a Forrest Gump reference because your dad was a lot cooler than Forrest Gump, but, but he, uh, your father showed up all over the place. You mentioned Austin. People probably have heard of Antone's Blues Club. Who played opening night, 1976, July 4th, Clifton Chenier? Who played a week-long residency every summer for Clifford Antone, Clifton Chenier and the Red Hot Louisiana Band? So you don't have to go very far to find Clifton. Um, and it, again, is amazing how he found his way into all these different places. And um, speaking of, Sonny, what's, what's on the horizon for you guys musically? Uh, we got shows. We're really glad things have opened back up, and as everyone has said, and, uh, there's only uh, so much you can do playing at home, sitting on your couch. I mean, I can do that, but it's a lot more fun uh, and have all you folks come out. So we have a lot of shows, but but we're we're looking at doing this collaboration in the spring. So y'all keep an eye out for that. It's gonna be big fun. Good. Yeah. And Sherelle, in New Orleans, you get to you get to jam a little bit with some folks? Yeah, well, when the guys come my way, they don't ever hire a washboard player. It's cheaper because I'm already there. They don't have to pay for mileage. And anytime, again, if I can play with the guys that are still here from the old school or at CGC, the real school, I'm taking every opportunity there is um, for when they call me New Orleans. But I also play with the brass bands. I play the bass drum for those guys and come home and do festivals. Play with Lil Pop and, and Leroy Thomas. I play with them all. So when they call, I come. All right. Great. All right. And uh, I do one or two more. I didn't realize I was going ahead of schedule. That's good. Uh, seriously, anybody got a real question out there? No? Well, it's a great treat to be here with these artists. Let's let them go get their gig on. Thank y'all so much. How about it? In honor of Tiffany Smear, CJ, Sonny, for us.